It's an honor to introduce tonight's speaker, the perceptive, intrepid, and inspired author, print journalist, and broadcaster, Charles Glass. He comes to us fresh from travels in war torn Syria and Iraq. In his latest book, Syria Burning, ISIS and the Death of the Arab Spring is a must read for all who want to go beyond commonplace narratives of public diplomacy and peer deep into the Syrian inferno. Let's give a warm welcome to Charles Glass. Thank you very much to Dr. Eibner for inviting me here and to uh, Professor Salami for hosting me at this event and thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm very grateful to all of you. The Syria war is something that you've all been seeing on television or reading about on the internet or in newspapers. Um, it began in 2011, but um, before that, well before that, in, in the 1980s during when the world was in something called the Cold War, they used to tell a story in Syria about a public opinion poll that was being taken worldwide. And the public opinion poll was asking people the question, what is your opinion of eating meat? And at that time, in Poland, there were great food shortages, so they asked the Poles what their opinion was of eating meat, and everyone in Poland said, what do you mean by meat? And at that time, there was a famine in Ethiopia, and they asked the people in Ethiopia, what is your opinion of eating meat? And the Ethiopians all said, what do you mean by eating? But in Syria, they said, what is your opinion of eating meat? And everyone said, what do you mean by what is your opinion? <laughs> that was the state of Syrian politics. No one ever asked the Syrians their opinion. Hafez al-Assad and his son were not elected. The previous dozen military rulers of Syria were not chosen by the Syrian people. The French mandate that preceded it was not chosen by the Syrian people. They were never, ever consulted, except once. In 1918, when the British and the French occupied greater Syria, the United States sent a commission to the region called the King Crane Commission, to America's one academic, one an oil man, uh, who did actually a surprisingly good job of going around not only Syria but Iraq, both countries, and by Syria I mean what are today called Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, and sampled public opinion by receiving petitions, by holding public meetings, and writing down everything that everyone said. And they discovered in Syria that 80% of the population wanted the unity of Syria, of what are now these mini-states, indep full independence, and Faisal of the Hejaz, the famous Faisal who fought with Lawrence of Arabia, as the king of this united Syria. Meanwhile, in Iraq, 80% of the people wanted a divided Iraq. They wanted a separate Kurdish state and a separate Arab state, and no king from the Hejaz, but for them to choose their own leaders. So with, armed with this knowledge of what the population wanted, what did the British and the French do? They divided Syria and they united Iraq. They, imposed, they took Faisal out of Syria in 1920 when he was, he was momentarily the, the chosen king, chosen by the Syrian National Congress as their king, take, took him out and then imposed him on Iraq. And when they imposed him on Iraq, the Iraqis rebelled, the Kurds and the Arabs, and the British spent an entire summer massacring 10,000 Iraqis to impose this king that they didn't want. Meanwhile, the French were putting down rebellions in the Alawite areas, and then in Damascus and in Aleppo, because they didn't want this. And of course, the Palestinians certainly didn't want it because they realized that their country was going to be turned over to immigrants from Europe. The people in Transjordan were never consulted, and they they were contained by, by, by Prince Abdullah uh, with, with the help of British troops. The history of Syria, of modern Syria, has been a steady stream of dysfunctional governments and violence. The very first rebellion, big rebellion against French rule took place in 1925, led originally by a Druze leader called um, Shakib Arslan. Uh, Arslan was a, was a leading Druze notable who had been insulted by the French. 
in his, his hometown of Soweto. He had, his house, he had given refuge to someone who had tried to kill the French High Commissioner. And the French, when Arsan was not there, uh, came and arrested this man and took him out. It was a breach of Drew's hospitality, and it, it embarrassed Arslan because it showed that he couldn't protect people who had come and sought refuge with him. So he led a small rebellion, which was very quickly seized upon by most of the people in Syria. Christians joined, Sunni Muslims joined, Alawis joined in the north, and there were, the French almost lost control of Syria in 1925. But through steady military reinforcements, divide and conquer, and then the fact that the rebellion of 1925 started to receive help from the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia, who turned first on the Christians, so the Christians were forced out of this rebellion and no longer took part in what began as a nationalist rebellion against foreign occupation. It suddenly was transformed into a religious jihad against the Christians, the French, not just the foreigners, not just the occupiers. And of course, once it was divided, it was much easier to put it down, and which is, which is what happened. Syria endured another 15 years of French colonial rule, and these were not happy years, although the French did build schools and did build roads and did make some minor improvements. They also, in 1925, built prisons. Uh, the two most famous prisons, Tadmor, and Meza in Damascus are still prisons today. The, the Assad regime kept people in both, but now the Tadmor prison has been taken over by the Islamic State, and they're putting their, their prisoners in there. It's, uh, these are some of the marvelous legacies of, of colonial rule. In 1946, the French finally withdrew from Syria, largely under British and American pressure, gave the Syrians their independence, and for three years, Syria had a parliamentary democracy. Their first prime minister was a Christian, a Protestant, who was, had been born in Lebanon, but at that time it had been part of Syria. And he was called Faris al-Khuri. He was a very successful prime minister. Um, the, the president, was, of whose name I now forget, forgive me. I think it was, it was, um, do you, was it? No, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. The poor man. <laughs> Uh, in 1948, the Syrians, like all the other Arab states, lost the war against Israel and were under a lot of popular pressure to make changes because the armies were very badly armed and, and in the field did not perform well, despite the desire of their people, or the, actually the fantasy of their people, that these armies were formidable forces and would perform well. So the, the regime, although elected, was less and less popular. Just at that time, the Arabian American oil company, Aramco, wanted to build a pipeline for its oil from the eastern province of Saudi Arabia through Transjordan, Syria, and into Lebanon so that ships could come and take the oil in the Mediterranean and, and deliver it to Europe and the United States more cheaply. Uh, Jordan signed the agreement immediately. Lebanon signed immediately, but the, but the Syrian parliament wanted to debate the issue and try to achieve better terms from Aramco than they were getting. Well, this really wasn't good enough for the United States. The CIA station chief in Damascus went to see the chief of staff, um, um, God, I'm so sorry. I'm a bit tired because I've just, I've, just, I've just flown from Beirut to London to here last night and I'm a bit tired. Uh, Hosni Zaim was the, was the chief of staff and they approached Hosni with the idea of staging a military coup against this government. Zaim did this, and the next day signed the, the Tapline Treaty so that the tap, tap line would go through Syria, which it actually did. He, in a, and, in, and a month later, he signed the truce with, with Israel, giving Israel its gains in the, from the 48 war. He was then overthrown, and Syria endured a period from the 1950s through the 60s of a military coup d'etat every couple of years. The instability in Syria made life almost impossible for your average Syrian. And when the United States talks about bringing democracy to Syria, it should remember it destroyed the only democracy Syria ever had. And in 1970, after these coups, counter-coups, and coups, the most 
effective conspirators in the Syrian army were the Alawite Baathist Baath Party members. The Alawites, who themselves were, are a secretive religion. They had to be secretive to survive under Ottoman rule, a Sunni rule, which regarded them as heretics with, within Islam. And so they, they were the best conspirators in the army and within the Ba'ath Party. They seized power in 1967, made Hafez al-Assad the, the, the chief of staff of the, of the Air Force, and then minister of defense. And then he staged his coup, driving out some of the other Ba'athist Alawis, but with his clan of, of Alawis. And he staged his coup, and that was the last coup. So from 1970 today to today, there hasn't been a single military coup in Syria, which gave Syria its first period of post-colonial continuity, if not stability, because it, it, there were uprisings. There was a uh, Muslim Brotherhood uprising against the Alawis, against the Alawi regime from 1979 to 1982, which the government ultimately suppressed in Hama in the spring of 1982, killing anywhere between five and 15,000 people in Hama. But, and, and there was a similar rebellion in Aleppo, but which was put down with less ferocity because there were fewer Muslim brothers there. That, that, was, that, was, that solidified the regime's hold. And from then to now, the regime has been fairly strong and fairly consistent. Hafez al-Assad died in 2000. His son took over um, in what this, this strange Arab custom of hereditary republics. Um, which did, which should never have happened, uh, but it did, and uh, the Syrians, again, were not consulted, no one asked them their opinion, and there were never genuine elections. There was a referendum on whether he should be president or not, and he got 98% of the vote, not entirely surprisingly. And um, he, he began something called the Damascus Spring, where he invited civil society groups to come forward and state their case and have public debates and public discussion of, of reform and of change. And there was a great, I remember going to Damascus at that time just after he came in, <coughs> and there was a great hope among many people who had been in jail under the, under the father that the son would make changes. He, he became a slight darling of the Western media because he'd been educated in England. Although why that should have made any difference, I, I have no idea. But that was, that was the, the fiction. Anyway, he, he abandoned this fairly quickly when he saw that what people wanted, well, they, they wanted change, but so much change that it would have threatened his regime and his, his what he felt was hereditary right to rule. So the, the forward move, momentum of that Damascus Spring was very, very quickly stopped. So by, the, by 2011, when the whole Arab world was engulfed in this Arab Spring, the Tunisians had overthrown Ben Ali, their, their dictator. The Libyans were overthrowing um, Gaddafi, and the Egyptians had overthrown Mubarak in January. There was a feeling that the whole Arab world might actually improve, that the people themselves might actually have a say in how they were governed. This, there was an incident in Dara, on the border between uh, Syria and Jordan, on the, on the Syrian side where some children had written some graffiti against the government. And the governor there, who was a cousin of Bashar al-Assad, arrested the children and tortured them. This was a little bit too far even for Syrians who were pretty used to mistreatment. Torturing children was, was a red line. So they demonstrated in the streets. And they demonstrated very vociferously. And they were using some of the same slogans that had been used in Tunisia and in, and in Egypt. But they weren't calling for the end of Assad's rule. They were calling for him to make changes, for him to get rid of the governor, for him to improve things so that this would not happen again. He didn't listen. He didn't arrest his cousin. He didn't um, invite the spokesman for these demonstrators to come and see him or to see other officials and, and work out what their grievances were and deal with it. He did exactly what his father had done in Hama, which was to crush them. And that, I think, was his fatal mistake because the re that enraged people elsewhere in Syria, and the fact that people any, anywhere in Syria had demonstrated against him gave others inspiration to do the same. So Humps became a hotbed of dissidents. Damascus became a hotbed of dissidents. There were huge demonstrations 
again calling for reform initially and later calling for the end of the regime. While this was all going on, the United States, Britain and France, which had been harboring for some time the wish to dispose of Bashar al-Assad and his regime, seized this opportunity to persuade some of the members of the Syrian opposition, mainly those in exile, to arm the opposition and turn, it, turn what, was what had been peaceful demonstrations into a civil war. <coughs> Admittedly, the, the regime had used violence against the demonstrators, had shot them, but I remember speaking to many of the organizers of the demonstrations, particularly in Damascus, who said they don't, didn't want to fight back. They wanted to pursue a strategy that the regime was not prepared to cope with, that strategy being non-violent, civil disobedience, general strikes, and freezing the country so that he had to make concessions or leave. It might have, it's a policy that might have failed, but it would not have led to 250,000 dead, another 750 to a million wounded, and half the country made homeless, which is what the war led to. At that time, uh, the ambassador, Tom Ford, um, was, was helping to put together um, a Syrian government in exile while he was serving in Damascus. He, a friend of mine told me that he approached, that Ford approached him and said that he would, he would make him a minister in this new government and that Bashar would be overthrown very quickly and that, they, they, that they, this man could come back to Damascus as part of a new um, American chosen government, like, like the American chosen government in Iraq. My friend refused because he didn't, he didn't think it was, one, he didn't think it was right, and two, he didn't think it was a practical proposition, which it certainly turned out not to be. The French ambassador, before he left, had dinner with some friends of mine in Damascus, and they said, well, we're very sorry to see you go. He said, don't worry, we'll be back with the new government in two months. And this was, this was in April of 2012. Well, it's, it's now October of 2015, and the war is still going on, and there's no, <coughs> no prospect of, of a conclusion to this war. In fact, the war has spread. It has spread to Iraq thanks to the, the strength and determination of the Islamic State, or one, what, as, as it was called, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. This, this organization came out of Iraq originally. Many of them graduates of the American prison system in Iraq. Many of them had gone underground when the Sunni awakening in Iraq um, put an end to their movement as an, as an active violent force. But when they saw the anarchy in Syria, they saw an opportunity to go into Syria and take ground there, which is exactly what they did. They then split into Jabhat al-Nusra and the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. <clears throat> so at one time, not only did they split, at one time Jane's Defense Weekly estimated there were 1,500 rebel groups operating in Syria. The, the regime was relying very effectively on the divisions in the opposition. Because when you're, when you're fighting 1,500 groups, it's very easy to pick them off one at a time. And this has still been one of the regime's great strengths, is that the opposition is so badly divided. Many of those who joined the rebellion in the early days included Christians, included Alawis, included Druze. But when the jihadists co-opted the revolution, these people were driven out because their own survival was at stake. They're, is there a, a, a water anywhere? Else? The, the, thanks, sorry about that. I, mean, I, spoke to, I spoke to Alois Andrews' friends who were against the regime 100% and were active in working against the regime. Thank you very much. Act, active, who, who were very active in working against the regime in the early months of the, the rebellion who have now had to side with the regime because the people who were likely to replace the regime want to annihilate them. Uh, I mean, a Druze friend of mine says, how, how can I support people who want to come and destroy my village and kill me? I mean, they don't, there's no option. So they, have, they now have to, they have to support the regime. In the Druze areas now, they're fighting against ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra, but not to take territory, but just to protect their own villages. So the government has given them weapons to protect their own villages, which frees up the army to fight elsewhere. The, the rebellion has been very badly managed. The regime has been very brutal. The, the outside powers have come in in a huge way. So the, the regime is supported by Russia and Iran, always has been, and the opposition is supported by the United States, Britain, France, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey. 
So these, these constellation of forces mean that the, the Syrians who are fighting are fighting a proxy war for others. And until these great powers, both regional and the superpowers, agree that the war should end, it will not end. In fact, what is happening, what is happening as I speak, is the war is escalating dramatically. The Russians have now entered with not only sending weapons to the regime as they were doing before, but sending their own troops, sending their own um, airplanes and drones to support the regime and, get, and help the regime to win back the territory it's lost over the last four and a half years. The Americans, in response, are stepping up their games. The, the, the Saudis have given anti-tank weapons to the jihadists. The Americans have funneled more and more weapons to the jihadists. The Turks have left the border open for the jihadists to come and go and for new recruits to come in. Most ordinary Syrians who can get out are getting out. I mean, half the population has, dis has been displaced. Of that 12 million or so who are displaced, about 5 million are outside the country, 7 million displaced within the country, and those, excuse me, that's better. Those who are outside in the camps now are facing the problem that the United Nations no longer has the money to feed them because the donors, many of whom were are Arab states who were fueling this rebellion, who helped to make them homeless, are not giving any money. And this, the countries that should be taking them in, those who are responsible for what's happening, like Britain, France, and the United States, are not taking them in. Germany, which played no role in this war, is taking in 300,000. But everyone else is turning their back on them. And it's, it's, it's disgraceful that you can fuel a war in a country and at least not either pay to help, help them with medicine and food in the camps in Lebanon and Syria and, and Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey, but you're not even going to open your doors to them or not even fund the, the UN to feed them in these camps. I didn't mean to irritate you so much. Anyway, um, if, anyone, if anyone else wants to drift out now, this is your chance. Otherwise, you're stuck. All right. So I'm, I'm painting a bleak picture because it is a bleak picture. I've just spent the last month between Syria and, and Iraq both, and I don't foresee a solution to the problem. I don't foresee it getting better. I see both countries fragmenting more and more. More and more people are being armed, not as army, but as militias. The foreign powers are stepping up their game in both countries. And this is going to be a, a long and bloody war that will have a great impact in Europe as more refugees go to Europe. Less so here because people aren't being allowed in here. But it, it, is, it is going to be a fundamental American foreign policy issue for years to come. At the moment, the U.S. still thinks it can win in Syria, is behaving as if it still thinks it can win in Syria, and the Russians are behaving as if they can win in Syria, but given the fact that the, the forces are equally balanced, it's unlikely either side will win in Syria, which means the Syrian people will be the loser. 